How's it going, you sexy beasts? Welcome back once again to another edition of Jarathimus Gaming. Yesterday, we were given game update number 11, which is built to be a quality of life patch, modifying some game mechanics, changing some numbers, and adding more polish to the gameplay of Planet Side 2. A few things to note are shotgun nerfs, Empire-specific heavy weapons getting buffed, new resource changes for vehicles, the Zealot Overdrive and Infrared Night Vision Scope nerfs, flak changes, some more text tutorials, and a minor change to how Continent Cockering operates. If you'd want to read along the patch notes with me, I'll be linking the form post from the person in the description below. This video won't cover every single change from the patch, but the main points of the update that I find most game-changing or most impactful on your gameplay. Go ahead, grab a snack, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. The very first thing you'll step upon into Araxis is the change to resources for vehicles in the max suit. To help balance resource costs to the resource income of players, the resource needed to spawn every vehicle in the game has increased aside from the Galaxy and the Sunderer. Taking it from the top, the Flash ATV had its resources cost increased from 25 to 100. The Lightning Tank had its resource cost increased from 200 to 300. Main Battle Tank had their resource increased from 250 to 450. Empire Specific Fighters had their resources increased from 200 to 250. The Liberator had its resources increased from 300 to 350. And the trusty old Max Suit had its resource cost changed from 100 to 350. Like I've said, the changes to resource costs are to balance out the sheer amount of resources that players are given from territorial income. Currently, if you spawned a vehicle and just threw it away in combat, then by the time the cooldown had finished, you'll more than likely be resource capped again anyway. With this patch, it's supposed to be more of a balance toward if you want to get a vehicle, or if you're trying to actually spend your resources wisely. Some alterations to the requirements for continent conquering has been brought into play and is implemented with anti-turtling in mind. Previously, a faction had to conquer the entire continent aside from warp gates to gain the benefits. As it stands now, a faction will need to capture 75% of the continent's location to lock it down and reap the benefits. This change does not alter the continent conquering alert, requiring a faction to fully capture a continent. That still remains at 100% of the continent being captured. A simple text tutorial for the map has been added and can be accessed by clicking the help button at the top of the map screen. If you're getting overwhelmed with map information, this will help alleviate some headache and usher you in the right direction. The instant action feature has been given a retweaking, which should hopefully help sustain proper fights. Using instant action will prefer a fight where your empire is at a slight disadvantage and will attempt to ignore fights where your empire is completely dominating. Hopefully this will allow a more medium-sized fights to be spread across the continents, as opposed to being one massive war going on at a single facility. A few things were changed for infantry combat, but luckily all for the better. Friendly cloaked infiltrators will now be highlighted with your faction's color. Hopefully this change will stop me from shooting my friends in the face on accident, or maybe on purpose. Player movement was slightly changed, making players have to accelerate to their maximum speed when quickly changing directions. This is to both negate player warping through the server's lag compensation and to reduce the effectiveness of serpentine maneuvers at range. Light Assault Drifter Jump Jets now yield a speed boost while running across horizontal ground. I'm starting to imagine some awesome melee Light Assault loadouts here in the future if these things get any more speed. Probably be trying that out soon. Infrared night vision scopes are now burdened by weapon sway as well as a slight delay when aiming down the sights before the night vision actually kicks on. No more is the scope king for the CQC player and is actually balanced. Underbarrel attachments for weapons are now remapped to the same key that your primary weapon is bound. Previously, the underbarrel would replace itself in the button loadout, causing some odd inconsistencies across multiple loadouts or classes. Now, if you want to get an underbarrel attachment, pressing the same key you have bound for your primary weapon while your primary weapon is in your hands will then switch to the underbarrel. Throne C4 now have a slight illumination, just like the anti-personnel mines that was introduced in game update number 8. Final rank of the engineer's repair tool will allow them to deconstruct enemy tank mines, which will yield them experience. There was a big overhaul for how Flak operates and how Flak comes from the Vanu and Terran Max units using their Empire-specific abilities. First off, the Vanu Sovereignty's Zealot Overdrive now takes 30% additional damage while active and will only increase the damage of Bursters while active by 15%, which is down from the previous 30%. The Terran Republic's Lockdown only increases the fire rate of Bursters by 20%, down from the previous 26%. 
Reload speed with bursters at max rank of lockdown has been hastened by 15%. These changes are to counteract the sheer strength that dual burster max suits had against air at extreme ranges. To help hammer in that fact, bursters now have a cone of fire bloom which expands the longer you fire the weapon, making consecutive fire to be less beneficial. Also, the detonation range of burster flak has been reduced from 5 meters to 4. If you're unaware of how flak operates, it automatically explodes near an aerial target regardless of where the projectile is going. Aiming above the ESF, the flak projectile should be going it. Instead, they're colliding with the side causing the flak damage. This detonation radius is what's being reduced. Small change, but still something to keep in mind. Now that Max Anti-Air had its effectiveness at range reduced, the Skyguard turret for the Lightning has its chance to shine. Projectiles move faster, the magazine size has been increased by 20 with additional ammo granted per each rank from certifications. There's no cone of fire or anything for the Skyguard, so go wild on aircraft thinking of doing a strafing run. A few weapons were changed this patch, which include every single shotgun in the game and Empire specific heavy weapons. First off, for shotguns, they've all had their per pellet damage reduced, including slug damage and the new conglomerate's max shotguns. The reduced damage is only minor, but will usually require one more pellet to down a target than previously. It may seem like a random change, but this is to help alleviate a spray and pray functionality of shotguns, but still reward well placed shots. There's been plenty of times where I'll fall victim to an enemy catching a few pellets on the outer spread of his shell and still down me despite him firing around like a madman. Honestly, you shouldn't see much of a difference in game as long as you're hitting your target center mass. Heavy Assault special weapons should now be a little more viable than they were previously. The Jackhammer, Mini Chain Gun, and Lasher have all been given some love in hopes that they can actually see some use in the battlefield. First off, with the conglomerate's jackhammer, the burst fire mechanic will fire three shells out at a rate of 450 rounds per minute, with additional ammo being added to the magazine to have nine shells in the weapon by default, and the ability to have iron sights and optical sight attachments. It's funny how this shotgun gets a buff, but then again, shotguns across the board got a nerf this patch, so you'll be able to shoot faster but be dealing a lot less damage than previously. Go figure. Terran's mini chain gun had its spin up time removed and will now have a ramp up time. The gun will fire immediately when you pull the trigger, but will fire off slowly and ramp up to its fire rate of 800 rounds per minute. Accuracy, bloom, and projectile speed have all been buffed to help help out the weapon, but also comes with a first shot recoil multiplier. All in all, an awesome change to help bring this weapon back into the scene. Banu's Lasher has been given a huge buff across the board, lowering reload times, first shot recoil multipliers, and overall recoil in general. Improved stats are more damage, increased fire rate, higher maximum and minimum damage values, and allies only take 25% of the damage if hit by a teammate's Lasher projectile. With the added ability for optics to be equipped to the Lasher, this weapon is going to see a large rise in combat usage. Vehicles didn't get a lot of loving this patch in terms of gameplay, but they sure did get some love for the cosmetic department. Tank and air superiority bonuses have been put in place, which yield more rewards for fighting the very vehicle type you're driving. So, flying an ESF will yield you more experience when you take out other ESFs, and the same goes for tanks fighting tanks. Vehicle cosmetics now have multiple slots to equip items you've unlocked. Previously, we had one cosmetic slot to attach what we've gotten. Now we have quite a few slots to show off our bling. For ground vehicles, we've got slots for camouflage, decals, exterior cosmetics, horns, luma fibers and future trim, chassis lights, tires, antennas, and windshields. For aircraft, we've got slots for camouflage, decals, cockpit glass, exterior fins, luma fiber, and future trim for those as well. Can't wait to see what kind of crazy combinations players come up with this. Only other thing to mention would have to be the rework of the Terran Republic's G. 30 Vulcan secondary weapon for their vehicles. This weapon will act just like the mini chain gun change in that it will fire right when the trigger is pulled and fire at its maximum fire rate after one second. Maximum ammo and magazine capacity have been doubled and with reduced projectile gravity and a tighter cone of fire, this thing has become a beast for both fighting armored and aerial targets alike.
Opening up any loadout screen, you'll immediately notice a big change over the old one. Any slot you have selected will show locked, unlocked, and upgradable items that can be certified. Upon opening any slot, such as the suit slot for your character, items of every type that can fit in that slot will be shown regardless of whether you've unlocked them or not. If you have unlocked them, and the items possess multiple tiers of certification, it will show how many certs you need to reach the next level, and will display at what level the certification is currently certified. This works across everything that has the ability to have its loadout altered, such as ground and aerial vehicles. Pretty sweet addition to help remove the sheer clutter of the cert tree and organize it by slot. That's all I got for you sexy beasts in regards to game update number 11. Once again, this patch was more of a refinement patch instead of a content patch. What all are you guys liking about the patch so far? I'm really liking both the added customization to vehicles and the improved loadout screens. Let me know what you like or dislike about this patch in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a big ass thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs it down and let me know what I can improve upon. Want to see more videos like this? Then go ahead and subscribe. It's free.